Thank you all for coming out this morning. Amen. Uh, I've had a wonderful time in the Lord. We had such a great Sunday school time together. I've really been enjoying that. Brother Eddie is doing such a fantastic job in that class. And I really enjoy that time. I've enjoyed the praise and worship. And I just appreciate you all coming out and worshiping the Lord this morning. Amen. Um, Pastor Vic, he reached out to me the other day, let me know he was sick. And he asked me to uh, preach this sermon for him. And uh, I thought it was funny. Because uh, I told him, I was joking, I said, you're going to let me do your dirty work this, this morning because uh, of the topic that he asked me to preach on. And so uh, he's going to let me catch the flack this morning, but that's okay. Uh, I've already made these people mad enough, so a little bit more ain't going to hurt nothing. Uh, but he wants me to preach on the sin of pride as it relates to this month. Uh, I know many of us don't know, and praise God that you don't know, but June in America has been declared Pride Month. And uh, so this morning, I want to give a precursor. I'm obviously, as a preacher of God, not going to say anything nasty this morning, but I'm preaching against something called homosexuality. Now, in doing so, I'm going to talk to you about their history, where it came from to some extent briefly, so you get some context. That being said, um, it's impossible to preach against that without some things being a little bit provocative. Now, I'm not going to say provocative things, I want to skirt around the, those parts, I guess you could say. But some of this to you might be a little bit extra. But the point of me saying these things is so that you see something for what it is. A lot of times I think Christianity, we, we set around so blind and inactive in our faith in the world because we live as if things are better or prettier or cleaner than they are. And so it makes us feel better. Like, for example, America and America being in the shape it's in. I talk to people all the time. They don't want to even have that conversation because it makes the world around them feel less peaceful, makes them uncomfortable. So they don't want to approach those topics. They want everything to be love and rainbows. And so no pun intended this morning. But uh, just to say that I'm going to be plain spoken. And I think that a minister should be plain spoken. I also have love in my heart for these people involved in this movement, okay? Of the years that we've went preaching at these events, I and a few brothers are the only ones I've seen at these events. Now, why would I go? I ask them that all the time. If, if they ask us, why do you come? You must hate us. Well, the Bible says, how shall they be saved unless the preacher be sent to them? Now, if I wanted someone to die lost, I wouldn't go and preach to them. I'd say they're too far gone. They're goners. You know, forget about them. We're not going to go preach the everlasting gospel. It's too late for them. That's not what we believe. Especially in the Nazarene church, we believe the gospel is able to save people. And I know that Christians believe this from the uttermost. Amen. And so uh, I believe when we go, the power of God is able to save souls. Yeah. That's why we go. So we don't go because we hate these people. We go because we love these people. Yeah. Now, on the flip side, it's good for Christians to understand this movement for what it is and the sin of pride so that we don't fall into either being supporters of this, casual like, towards this, and we understand our culture around us so we know how to wage Christian warfare in an appropriate manner. So I don't preach on this topic this morning because I particularly think that these people are terrible. You know what I mean? All sin leads to hell at the end of the day. And so I'm not picking on one certain sin. But we must preach on the full counsel of Scripture. And that includes this topic so just as John 3.16 is in our Bible, and just as much as we know those, that verse is true and valuable, so are verses against homosexuality and et cetera, things of that nature. So in order to preach the whole counsel of God, I think this has to happen. And I didn't, at the end of the day, Pastor Vic asked me to preach on this topic. So I'm just doing my part. So uh, we'll open up our Bibles to, I think, Romans chapter 1 this morning will be the first place. I'm going to quote a lot of scriptures this morning. So if you have a notepad and paper, it would be beneficial to write them down because we don't have time to turn to every verse I'm going to read. But I will read the verses for you so that you can just kind of hear them along. But when I want you to turn to a certain place, I'll say that so we can then read it together for the sake of time. Time management. So I'm going to do some background history while you turn there. You're going to think this is too lengthy of an intro. When is he going to get to the scripture? I promise we will get to the scripture. The scripture is an essential part of everything we have to say as preachers. But it is good that I bring up historical context. So bear with me until we get to Romans 1. 
why I'm going to say all these things. It's important, so please be patient with me. The LGBT, has anyone ever heard those letters, LGBT? It means lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and sometimes they throw on 20 or 30 other letters on the back end of it, depending on who you're talking to. But LGBT Pride Month occurs in the United States to commemorate the Green Witch Riots, known as the Stonewall Riots of 1969, which occurred at the end of June 1969 in New York. So, I don't know, some people in here may even remember this in the news not telling anyone's ages or anything, you know, Murky back there might be familiar with this to some of God. I'm not going to pick a fight with you, Murky, no way. As a result, many pride events are held during this month to recognize the impact that this movement has had in the world. Obama said in May 28, 2010, I call upon all Americans to observe this month by fighting prejudice and discrimination in their own lives and everywhere it exists. Three presidents, only three presidents in American history have ever declared June as Pride Month. Only three. First was President Bill Clinton. He declared June Gay and Lesbian Pride Month in 1999 and in 2000. Then from 2009 to 2016, each year he was in office, President Obama declared June as LGBT Pride Month. Later, President Joe Biden declared Pride Month last month and this month. Donald Trump became the first Republican president to acknowledge LGBT Pride Month in 2019. He did so through tweeting rather than an official proclamation. The tweet was later pulled back and he made an official statement from the president declaring June as Pride Month. History of how Pride and LGBTQ movement got started. I said this word a minute ago, the Stonewall Riots, also known as the Stonewall Uprising, happened in the gay community of Greenwich, New York in 1969 in response to a police raid that began in the early morning hours of June the 28th, 1969 at the Stonewall Inn in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of Lower Manhattan, New York. Patrons of the Stonewall, other village lesbian and gay bars and neighborhood street people fought against the police when the police raided this bar. The riots are widely considered the watershed event that transformed the country into a gay liberation movement and gay rights in the United States. As was common for American gay bars of the time, the Stonewall Inn was owned by the Mafia. While police raids on gay bars were routine in the 1960s, officers quickly lost control of the situation at Stonewall this day. At 1.20 a.m. on Saturday, June the 28th, four plainclothes policemen in dark suits, two patrol officers in uniform, detectives Charles Smith and Deputy Inspector Seymour Pine arrived at the Stonewall Inn's double doors and announced police were taking the place. Inspector Pine recalled that the crowd, most of whom were homosexual, had grown to at least 10 times the number of people who were arrested. Now, at this time in America, open affection between gay men and women was not allowed. It was considered illegal. Homosexual couples could be arrested. And so gay bars were undercover. This was not allowed. Also, what was not allowed was the mafia. And it just so happens they run hand in hand together. Now, at this bar was underage drinking, pedophilia, uh, men grooming kids, young boys off the streets would go in here. It was a den of tons of criminal activity, okay? So this is part and parcel why the police raided this place. So Inspector Pine recalled that the crowd outside the bar when they raided it had grown to a seven to ten times greater than the people they had arrested inside. The police tried to restrain some of the crowd, knocking a few people down. I'd probably be knocking people down too if people were punching me in the face and spitting on me. They try to demonize the police all the time. It's the police's fault. Of course it isn't which incited bystanders even more. Some of those handcuffed in the wagons escaped when the police left them unattended. As the crowd tried to overturn the police cars, two police cars in a wagon with tires slashed, the police left immediately, with Inspector Pine urging them to return as soon as possible. The commotion attracted more people who learned what was happening. Someone in the crowd declared that the bar had been raided because the mafia did not pay the cops off, to which someone else yelled, let's pay them off then. Coins sailed through the air towards the police as the crowd shouted pigs and F cops. Beer cans were thrown and the police lashed out, dispersing some of the crowd who found a construction site nearby, lo and behold, with piles of bricks. The Democrat playbook has never changed, has it? I don't mean to be political so much this morning. But the Antifa riots, they found piles of bricks everywhere. It's just so strange how that never seems to change. 
Ten police officers, including two police women, then barricaded themselves inside the stone wall as the crowd began to riot, fearing for their lives. The homosexual mob began to light garbage cans, paper, and stuff them into the stone wall, attempting to burn down the building, killing the officers inside. They attempted to do so. The tactical patrol force was called in to save the officers, which had barricaded themselves inside the stone wall. Many officers were injured, with several being rushed to the hospital. The next night, rioting gathered as the movement then known as the Black Panthers and the Democratic Socialist Movement put out a call to assist the homosexuals in Greenwich at Stone Wall. The second night, one witness reported, thousands of people had gathered in front of the Stone Wall bar, which had opened again, choking Christopher Street until the crowd spilled into adjoining blocks. The throng of people surrounded buses and cars, harassing the occupants unless they either admitted they were gay or indicated that they supported them for being gay. So they were pulling people out of their cars and beating them unless they agreed with what they were doing, sounds like today, and unless you were one yourself. You don't have a right to be neutral in the matter for these people, as we'll see a little later. The riots at Stonewall sparked a nationwide battle over homosexuality and many movements came out from that night. The first new movement to develop after Stonewall was something known as the Gay Liberation Front. Their slogan was, do you think homosexuals are revolting? You bet your bleep we are. That was their slogan. What a doozy. One historian noted the GLF borrowed tactics from the uh, uh, tactics and align themselves with the black and anti-war demonstrators with the ideal that they could work to restructure American society. So one way that they've sought to do this is by making their movement, their, their sexual desires, equal with like uh, human rights and things of that nature. You know, it's our right to do this. It's our right to do that. The next prominent group to form was the Gay Activities Alliance. It was noted of them that they developed a political tactic known as zapping politicians. They would catch a politician off guard during a public relations meeting or a speech uh, and look at it as an opportunity and force him or her to acknowledge gay and lesbian rights. City councilmen were zapped and a mayor, John Lindsay, was zapped several times, once on television when gay liberation members made up the majority of the audience secretly and then began to interrupt his speech, demanding and threatening his life unless he started to show favoritism and kindness towards them. So it's always been violent is what I'm getting my point at here. It's always been chaotic. It's always been hate that has been behind this movement. Now, I have something a lot of you may have never known of or heard of. It's called the Homosexual Manifesto. This disgusting document was written by a man known as Michael Swift. He was the chief author at a publication known as The Gay Revolutionary, one of the chief homosexual publications of all time. In 1987, the homosexual movement as a whole agreed that Michael's writing of a document known as the Homosexual Manifesto embodied this movement's goal and mission. I want to quote to you some of this manifesto. It was officially submitted by the LGBTQ movement to Congress February the 15th of 1987. The document reads, We shall sodomize your sons, emblems of your feeble masculinity, of your shallow dreams and vulgar lies. We will seduce your sons in your schools, in your dormitories, in your gymnasiums, in your locker rooms, in your sports arenas, in your seminaries, in your youth groups, in your movie theaters, in your bathrooms, in your army bunkhouses, in your truck stops, in your mail clubs, in the houses of Congress, wherever men are with men together. Your sons shall become our minions and they will do our bidding. They will be recast in our homosexual image. They will come to crave and adore us. Women, you cry for freedom. You say you are no longer satisfied with men. They make you unhappy. We, connoisseurs of the masculine face, the masculine physique, shall take your men from you then. We will amuse them. We will instruct them. We will embrace them when they weep. Women, you say you wish to live with each other instead of with men. Then go and be with each other. We shall give your men pleasures that they have not known because we as foremost men too only know how to please another man. Only one man can understand the depth, the feeling, the mind, the body of another. All laws banning homosexual activity will be revoked. Instead, legislation shall be passed which engenders love between men. All homosexuals must stand together as brothers. We must be united artistically, philosophically, socially, politically, and financially. We will triumph only when we present a common face to the vicious heterosexual enemy. If you dare to cry 
uh, I use this word. This is their writing, okay? I don't believe in the use of this word to derogatory someone, but this is what they said. If you dare to cry, faggot, fairy, queer at us, we will stab you in your cowardly hearts and defile your dead puny bodies. We shall write poems of love between men. We shall stage plays in which men openly caress each other. We shall make films about love between heroic men, which will then replace the cheap, superficial, sentimental, insipid, and juvenile heterosexual infatuations currently in present in modern-day media. We will unmask the powerful homosexuals who masquerade as heterosexuals, and you will be shocked and frightened when you find that your presidents and their sons your industrialists, your senators, your mayors, your generals, your athletes, your film stars, your television personalities, your civic leaders, your priests are not the same familiar faces that they present themselves to be. We are everywhere and we have infiltrated your ranks. They continue. All churches who condemn us will be closed. Our only gods are handsome young men. We adhere to a cult of beauty, moral, aesthetic. All that is ugly, vulgar, and banal we will annihilate. Since we are alienated from the middle-class heterosexual conventions, we are free to live our lives according to the dictates of pure imagination. For us, too much is never enough. Sounds like sinners to me. The exquisite society to emerge will be governed by an elite compromised of gay people. And they finish their statement here saying, We too are capable of firing guns and manning the barricades of ultimate revolution. Tremble, hetero swine, when we appear before you unmasked. What do you think of that? Sounds like war to me. We have lived so long in darkness and ignorance that we think that this is a nice little movement and they fly rainbows and they say love wins. This is demonic. It goes even further. The LGBTQ movement, if you, sometimes you've ever heard those letters in a row. Sometimes there's a P on the end of that, LGBTQ P. Now, the P is in debate amongst these people. Some of them still have kind of a conscience, and they argue about what this P should stand for, but it does stand for something, even though they try to hide it. Sometimes within the gay pride movement, you will hear them say the letters LGBTQ, and they won't stop there. They'll add a P on the end. Within the movement of homosexuality, the disgusting evil known as pedophilia. In the homosexual manifesto above, they clearly state that their intention is to sodomize your sons wherever they find them. That's pedophilia. The P, my friends, is pedophile or pedosexual. Or as they call them today, minor attracted persons, to make it sound sweet. There is an organization still associated today within the pride movement known as NAMBLA. It's called the North American Man-Boy Love Association, whose slogan is eight is too late. They are an organization of grown men who are dedicated to decreasing the stigma of grown men wanting sexual relations with children. When you see a P in the LGBTQ slogan, this is men wanting sexual relations with boys. Young boys, that's the P in LGBTQP. The future, a year after the uprising in Stonewall, June the 28th, 1970, the first gay pride march took place in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, and then San Francisco. Within a few years, gay rights organizations were founded across the U.S. and the world. And today, LGBT pride events are held annually in June in honor of the Stonewall riots. What our presidents say is, Pride Month. In Northern Hemisphere, New York annual uh, New York annually holds the largest pride with 2.5 million people attending this event on average. Sao Paulo, Brazil is annually the largest in the Southern Hemisphere with 2.5 million in attendance. Tel Aviv, Israel is the largest pride parade on average in Asia. Now, every major town in America has some type of homosexual pride event every year, usually between the months of May to July, with now even small towns being invaded by this perverted ideology, with Ashland, Kentucky hosting its first gay pride event just last summer with well over one to 2,000 people in attendance. The war is on, my dear friends. That's what we've come to preach to you this morning, is against this movement and what they stand for. And so that's, I think, when you hear it quoted, you hear their motivations, 
Dear friends, we, we need to see this from the Bible. We need to see this from the Bible. It's, that, it's declared Pride Month, is it not? And the Bible has something to say about pride. Stay in Romans 1. Isaiah 2.12 says, The day of the Lord will be upon the proud, and the proud he will bring low. Proverbs 8.13, The fear of the Lord is to hate what is evil. Pride and arrogancy, the froward mouth do I hate. Proverbs 16.5, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination unto the Lord. Proverbs 16.18, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 21, verse 4, A haughty look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked are sin. Pride. Pride is the root of all sin, is it not? The idea of elevating oneself against the commandment of God. And as the devil said, I will become like the Most High. I will take away and have that praise that's due to him alone. It's I, it's me, focus. And that is attitude is pride. That's what we've come to speak to you this morning. Job 41.34 says the prince of devils is king over all the children of pride. That could not be more plain. The king of devils is, is, is king over all the children of pride, Job 41.34. Churches in our local area that support this, Asbury United Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church next to the movie theater down there on Main Street in Ashland, Canal United Presbyterian, Bridges of Grace, Chocolate Church, Methodist Church in downtown Ashland has uh, members on their board who were homosexual. Baptist Church in South Carolina hired a transgender male or dresses as a female to be their pastor. Churches in Huntington, next, uh, church in Huntington next to the gay bar, known as Stonewall. There's a homosexual bar in Huntington called Stonewall. That's the reason why, in honor of those riots. There's a church next to Stonewall who rents their parking lot out to this gay bar every weekend to make money off of the attendees of the gay bar. They rent their church parking lot out to this gay bar on the weekends because the bar has nowhere for people to park. It's just, it's, it's chaos. You know, it's baffling. And we, to us, praise God, it's, it's foreign. Such talk is foreign, but it's very common. The Bible in the Old Testament and in the New has much to mention on this sin. Leviticus 18.22 Leviticus 20 and 13 is where we can go uh, in the Old Testament first in order to discuss the issues at hand. Leviticus 18, 22. Sorry, I told you I wouldn't have you jump around, but we can go ahead and turn there. The, the tabs on our Bibles make moving around easier than the previous times, so... I believe you can jump there quickly. Leviticus 18.22. Very plain. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. You should not lie with a woman or a man as you would with a woman. It is an abomination. Now, in context here, when these letters were read, they read them amongst the men of the community. And then the men were supposed to teach their wives and daughters, etc. So that's why it's written with a male context in mind. A male will not lie with a male as he would with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20, 13. Just turn over a single page. If a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be surely put to death. Their blood shall be upon them, the Bible says, concerning man lying with man as he would with a woman in the Hebrew Old Testament. Now the word here, if a man lies with a man as he would with a woman, is a single word in the Hebrew language, and that word is sodomite, or a kadesh is the Hebrew word. It's a male temple prostitute, or a male that lies with a male. Now, some of them will try to argue, well, we are a, a, a faithful married couple, we've adopted children, they try to raise a family, they try to mimic the heterosexual marriage unit, and so, well, we're not temple prostitutes. But you see here, Kadesh had everything to do with homosexuality. In Roman culture, in Hebrew culture of the time, it was common for the gods, they called them, to be worshipped via gay sexual practices. In New Testament times, homosexuality had everything to do with prostitution, uh, gay gatherings, male with male, female with female, as we will see later in Romans chapter 1. Sodomite, Kadesh. 
Leviticus 18, 22, Leviticus 20 and 13. Sodomite, does anyone notice the word, comes from the city name Sodom or Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom in the Hebrew times was known for its party atmosphere and sexual degradation, especially as it relates to homosexuality. Now, what happened to the angels that looked like men that went to deliver Lot and his family out of Sodom? Who came running for them? It wasn't the women of the city. It was the men of the city from old to young that pursued after these angelic beings who looked like men who came to deliver Lot and his family. It was a gay uprising for the angels that had come into town. They had come to take them and lay with them, just like the Stonewall riots in New York. So people try to twist these words and get out from what it really shows. Sodomite or homosexuality, as it relates to this, is, is plainly seen in Genesis 19, 1 to 29. If you want to write that in your notes, that's the Sodom account. In Isaiah 3, 9, speaking of Israel's fall, the prophet Isaiah mourned that Israel declared their sin like Sodom. They did not hide it. They have brought disaster upon themselves. What does this movement do? They have parades. When's the last time you heard of a heterosexual parade where men and women rejoice in being married to one another? Why did there need to be a parade over what you do in your, in your bedroom, to be quite frank? Uh, what is there to celebrate? I don't understand it. And it's, it's they declare their sin. They force it upon you. When you go on Facebook, for those who have Facebook, all the businesses and corporations in June, what do they do? They change their emblem with rainbow colors in it to keep this movement happy and to keep them calm. So they cater to this movement. Point being is they declare their sin. They demand their sin be accepted. They demand that you look at it with a comfortable eye. They declare their sin as Sodom, Isaiah 3, 9. Deuteronomy 23, 17. It was the command of God that there shall be no whore in the daughters of Israel, nor Sodomite of the sons of Israel. There'll be none. That was God's command. None. No Sodomite in Israel to be tolerated. No whorish behavior to be tolerated in Israel. There it again, sodomite means one who practices male with male love as he would with a woman. Uh, speaking of Judah uh, fall into sin after the reign of Jeroboam, the Bible says there were also sodomites in the land and they did all the abominations of the people that the Lord cast out before them. So the sodomites of the land in Jeroboam's day did everything that the evil people did that God was trying to push out of Israel and out of Israel's way. But here we go. They say, oh, this is not in the Bible. That's one, two, three, four, five, six plus verses already in the Old Testament related to this sin. In the New Testament, the Greek word for a homosexual or sodomite is arsenokite. This means a male who lies with a male as he would a female or a female who lies with a female as she would with a male. Now, let's turn to the New Testament for some of our uh, references. That takes us back to Romans chapter 1. Beginning in verse 21. Now, I understand that I'm preaching to the choir this morning. And I don't think that I'm trying to convince anyone in here that this is a sin. But I do think it's important that we look at our Bible in its context and its fullness so we get a well-rounded picture of our Bible related to the topic at hand. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 20 and 1. Because that when they knew God... They did not glorify him as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to the uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, verse 26, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men lying with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things 
which are not convenient. They did this. God gave them up to that. They chose this. He turned them over to their heart's desire. They gave up God in Romans 1, 21 to 23. The Bible says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies. Romans 1 continues in verse 26, For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. In the next verses, Paul will discuss what he's talking about when he says vile affections. But for now we see, when society gave God up, God gave them up. When they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, they reaped the corruption of their own heart's lust. Society is doing the same today. What was looked down upon not 50 years ago is now supported and paraded in the streets and looked upon as normal. It's now considered cool to be or to profess to be a supporter or behave, one who does homosexuality. When culture by and large condemned it not too long ago, as culture has uh, sought to forget God, they have reaped the corruption of their own hearts. In verse 26, Paul says God gave them up to, quote, vile affections. Vile here means shameful, disgraceful, dishonorable, reproachful affections. Uh, reproachful and affections, vile affections here means a feeling, a desire of the mind, a passion, or lustful pursuit. So God gave them up to disgraceful desire, shameful feelings, and vile emotions. Just what are these vile emotions and disgraceful desires that Paul is referring to? He continues in verse 26 and verse 27. One translation reads Romans 1, 26 to 27 as this. For this reason, God gave them over to their own disgraceful and vile passion. Inflamed with lust for one another, men and women ignored the natural order and exchanged normal sexual relations for homosexual ones. Women engaged in lesbian conduct and the men committed shameful acts with other men, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their deviation. Romans 1, 26-27. The natural use is abandoned, the Bible says. The purpose of the act of male and female coming together right is the bearing of children. Deviation from this relationship results in a perversion of nature. God is against things that pervert nature. When something is done against nature, it reaps consequences. When a man poisons himself with alcohol, it destroys his liver. This is a destruction of nature. It's a deviation from nature. When I try to jump off a 30-story building and think I can fly, it's going to hurt when I hit the bottom. I don't have wings. That's a deviation of nature. Nature is a brutal teller of the truth. And God made nature as a testimony of what is normal, of what should be obeyed, of how we ought to live. And so when that is gone against, there's a natural corruption because God made us and he made nature. So we fit like a glove when we walk hand in hand. When we go against nature, then we reap consequences. God has established the natural order. When people go outside of that, that is considered unnatural or sin. And it brings consequence. They receive in themselves, the Bible says, the recompense of their error. It has been well speculated that this is biblical proof of why the homosexual movement has such a high prevalence of HIV and AIDS compared to the heterosexual population. Again, the recompense of their error, which was due. Now, I can speak as a person who works in the medical field taking care of homosexual patients. They are amongst, by far, the sickest people you will take care of. They have tons of unnatural diseases and unusual ailments. Their bodies are very sickly, oftentimes very malnourished appearing due to the diseases that are going on in them. And they are very mentally unstable. And that when you go and you live in sin, whether even if let's say you were never homosexual, you lived a heterosexual life, but you lived in fornication or adultery all your life, you know, that destroys your mind. Sin has a way of destroying you. And so whenever you pursue sin, it brings corruption and destruction. It really does. And so that's why, you know, the Bible warns against this behavior. It's not because it hates homosexual people or that Jesus didn't die for their soul's salvation, but because sin hurts people and God is out for our benefit, not our harm. In fact, the Bible says it's Satan who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came to give life and to give it more abundantly. So that's what we want to preach. Uh, praise God. Number se a second verse in the New Testament is Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21 this morning.
Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5 is a wonderful chapter, isn't it? The fruits of the Holy Spirit contested against the fruits and works of the flesh. Now, beginning in verse 19, Paul begins to read. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest or obvious, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, such the like which I tell you before and have told you in time past that they which do such things, such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the word fornication there has a broad meaning. Relations out of marriage is fornication. A fornication in its plainest terms is called is sexual perversion. We know, as we read from Romans 1, that uh, male with male or female with female, the Bible calls vile affections and sexual perversion. Now here it says, fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And so we see here too that sexual perversions and those who live in that will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, the third verse here is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And continues further, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Abusers of themselves with mankind in the Hebrew is a single word. Guess what it is? It's arsenokite. The Greek word for a male who lies with a male as he would a woman, or a woman who would lie with a woman as she would a male. That is the Greek word used. Now, we use a big, long phrase of this King James Bible, written in the time it was written a few hundred years ago. They had a lot of words for a lot of things, and abusers of themselves with mankind is the phrase that they used, abusers of themselves. They abuse each other and abuse themselves with this behavior. And that word is arsenikai. It's male with male and female with female behavior. And so here we go again in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. There it is again. The Bible could not be more plain. People who practice such things, it says right here in 1 Corinthians 6, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now it's interesting here too that a word is used called the effeminate in the King James Bible. Now, effeminate here literally means girly acting man. It also means a man who, uh, who confuses the genders, a man who cross-dresses or a man who behaves female when he is a male. That's what effeminate means. Now, it's contrasted, that word effeminate, then followed by arsenikai, uh, a girly acting man or a man who confuses the genders, and a homosexual practicer, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the Bible's pretty plain here. We'll begin to unpack this. Very plain. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 11. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 11. Paul talks about the use of the law. The law of God has a use, does it not? In Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, the law is a schoolmaster, and it brings us to Jesus. So when we listen to the law of God, it's not its purpose isn't to save us. Its purpose is to lead us to the Savior, to look to another. That's the purpose of the law. And Paul said the law has a use if a man would use it lawfully. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, he starts to say to the young protege Timothy, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, for murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. There it is again. For men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be anything that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust, abusers of themselves with mankind, Arsenikite, a man who lies with a man as he would a woman, a woman who lies with a woman as she would with a man. That is the word they're used for those who defile themselves with mankind. That phrase is one word, and it's the word we've mentioned. 
Paul associates the sin of homosexuality in the first Timothy chapter one with murders of fathers and murders of mothers, with whoremongers and with liars. That's who Paul associated this sin with. Murders of fathers, murders of mothers. That's who Paul Paul the Apostle, not Zachary Humphrey, but Paul the Apostle had associated this sin in a very narrow list. He associated this right here with such behavior. There it is, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 11. So people will start to tell me, they'll say, Zach, when I go to these gay prides and preach, they'll say, well, Paul, when I, when I win the argument there, and they say, okay, 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 Paul preached against homosexuality, that's fine. But where did Jesus preach against homosexuality? Jesus only talked about love. He never talked about sin. So where did Jesus talk about homosexuality? And we get it in Mark chapter 10, verse 6 through 9. Mark chapter 10, verse 6 through 9, Jesus preaches a sermon against homosexuality. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now that is confusing to people today. They asked the new Senate lady, what is a woman? And she couldn't answer. We don't know what a woman is. It blows your mind. She's making a couple hundred grand a year. You're taxpaying money. She can't identify what a female is or what a woman is or what a mother is or what a woman does. And it's pathetic. And, and so uh, we see here, God made them without confusion, male and female. Now, a female has XX chromosomes. A male has an XY chromosome. They cannot be confused. You can't have both. You're one or the other, and genetics proves what you are. So uh, there's confusion in our world today, what a male is and what a female is mentally, but there's no confusion scientifically as to what someone is biologically. You can't argue with biology. And the doctor's never confused. Isn't it amazing? The doctor is never confused at birth. You know, you never, you never like, oh, I don't know if this is a female or a male. I'm really confused right now. You know, the doctors have no confusion and God didn't either. And God made them male and female in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 6. For this cause, verse 7, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall too become one flesh. So then they are no more two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no one put asunder. Now, Jesus preached against homosexuality in this manner. He made them male and female, not male and male or female and female, and he defined the covenant of commitment to one another as between male and female, a biological male, XY, and a biological female, XX, are what are supposed to go together. And anything outside of that basic understanding of relationship is perversion, is outside of God's design and plan. Now, this is very easily understood in the construction world. You don't plug a male outlet into a male outlet. And you don't put a female outlet up against a female outlet. You get no functions from that. You get no functions from that. You cannot, it makes no sense. You see what I'm saying? You know, so the thing is, when people go against nature, only their uh, lust of their hearts and imaginations of their mind, as they said in their manifesto, gives them rise to these confusing things that they stand up for and try to argue. Basic logic bears this out, does it not? You don't put a male plug to a, uh, to a male or a female to a female. The natural order is against this. Nature bears the fact only male and female can come together and become one flesh. It's been said before, but it bears repeating. God made them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And so uh, we see here, God made them male and female. And uh, we have lost sight of that as a culture. Hebrews 13 verse 4 is another great verse against the idea that this is somehow not a sin. And we were in Hebrews this morning, starting in Hebrews in the Sunday school class. Hebrews is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's very deep in relationship to who Christ is and his saving uh, purposes for us. And in Hebrews 13, verse 4, the Bible says, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God himself will judge. So Hebrew, uh, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You see here, Jesus said in Mark 10 how marriage is to be honored. 
between a man and a woman. Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, those who dishonor this type of marriage, bed, with sexual perversion, God himself will judge. Now we remember this. This was near to our home not long ago. Remember all the drama not a few years ago when the lady would not give the marriage license to the homosexuals who demanded, demanded, give us our license. Make the cake and give us the license. And uh, she wouldn't do it. And so the lady got flat from uh, huge protests on national television. Ashland made it on to mainstream yet again. And uh, homosexual riots took place in Ashland, Kentucky, right at the federal building. They had to bring in SWAT team and all this stuff to make sure everything didn't get out of hand because they know this movement is violent. And so uh, we see here she stood up for God-based marriage. And as time has progressed and our country has fallen away, that cost her her job and her livelihood and her family's safety and everything. Laid it all on the line to stand up for God. What boldness. Praise God for her. And the Bible says here, whenever people dishonor marriage, God himself will judge them. And Jesus defined how the marriage bed is kept pure between one man and one biological woman. Not one who identifies as but one who is biologically, uh, scientifically one. Jude chapter 1, verse 7, and I'm about finished here. I know this has been a lot of verses I've thrown at you, and I don't mean to bounce around so much, but uh, I wanted to get all this uh, out there. Jude chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. <laughs> Dear friends, this is, this is the Bible. This is the word of God. Vengeance, eternal fire. I didn't write it, I promise. And so uh, we come to the Bible here. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner gave themselves over to fornication sexual morality, and going after strange desires and vile affections, that's what strange flesh is, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Going after strange flesh or homosexual behavior, the vile passions Paul mentioned in Romans chapter 1, Sodom and Gomorrah were set as an example, suffering the vengeance, the Bible says, of eternal fire. Psalms 9.17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell. And all nations that forget God. And we see this. Sodom and Gomorrah was turned into hell. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And what was Sodom and Gomorrah doing? That made God notice them. Took notice of them. And took, went out of his way to address Sodom and Gomorrah's sin. Sin of homosexuality. That was the biggie in God's eyes for why he picked them out. There's a big world on planet Earth with lots of cities and probably lots of sin. But God noticed Sodom and Gomorrah. The cry went up before him, and he sent them down to see if it was so, and it was. And they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. Dear friends, this is not uh, something to take lightly, right? You know, this is sin destroying our culture. And just like uh, Pastor Vic, you know, preached last week, he talked about, you know, part of loving our neighbor and how God... Uh, how God executes uh, and maintains culture is through the influence of the home first, the mother and the father to the child. And then Christians have an influence in our world, you know, through the church. And the government has influence on evil through its restraining power. And, but the church is to have a voice. Christians are to have a voice in their community and a voice in their world, even if they don't want to listen to you and to me. And that voice is for the sake of people's souls. And so it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's very uh, important that we see the need of this people, that the sin that's in their life is not something that God has ever taken lightly. God doesn't take sin lightly in anyone's life, of course. And Romans chapter 2 talks about, I know I've met people before. I think I was maybe preaching one time at a, at a, at a pride event in Lexington, and a, and a, and a guy had come up to me. And uh, he said, you know, isn't this just awful and disgusting and this and that? And yes, it is. But, uh, you know, he said he was like maybe a Baptist deacon from a local church and he was trying to walk home or parked his car at the parking garage. 
and he went into a business and he had to walk back to his car and he was just disgusted by it and this and that. And, and we should be disgusted by it. But the point of being disgusted is not just so we, you know, talk bad about people or we say how terrible they are. It's to save men's souls by <laughs> preaching to them the gospel. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 is where I will close. And the Bible says, after mentioning the homosexuality was a sin, that if someone lives in it, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Paul continues and he says, such were some of you. But you have been washed, but you have been sanctified, but you have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So some of the greatest Christians I have ever met were former homosexual practicing people. Some of the strongest believers and the most great of witness were people who were caught up in that lifestyle whom Jesus redeemed. Some of the best Christians we've ever met were once murderers, once liars, once blasphemers, once homosexuals. So whenever I look at this movement, I don't see that all is lost. When it's declared Pride Month, yes, I'm grieved, but I'm also hopeful that God's gospel can confront that and he can save people out of that. Amen. Amen. And so I don't come to this today to knock people or to sound hateful in any manner. I quoted, I'm blameless to you, nothing but Bible, Bible, Bible verses. And so I, I wanted to share that with you this morning on the, you know, the sin of homosexuality and sodomy and the importance, the importance of seeing it for what it is in our culture. Quoted to you their documents, their manifesto, so that you can hear what they really think and the spirit that that really comes from that. And so you know how to pray, even how to protect your children. You know, nowadays they host these uh, transgender uh, Bible story, book story hours where they read books to children and uh, they actually strip dance in front of the kids, and then they read to them pedophile literature, uh, homosexual literature. Happens in Huntington at the Black Sheep Burrito. That happens there a few times a month, uh, a few times a year, rather. Uh, a lot of libraries across America are hosting these drag queen story hours, they call it, where the parents will take their kids. And, and uh, there's been Christians who've infiltrated that and who are crying out politically for these movements to be stopped. Because it's considered grooming of kids. In fact, in the state of Florida just happened recently. The anti-grooming law uh, was passed to stop the talk of sex in elementary school kids. Seems like that shouldn't happen anyways. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but they read books to children and grown men dressed like women will dance in front of them like a club. And then uh, the kids will give them money and then they'll turn around and read books to these kids out of gay literature. Mm -hmm. This happens right in Huntington. So I just want to let you know and say, you know, dear friends, the, the battle is on and uh, God is able, able to save people, able to move in our culture. We just don't want to forget that our sword is sharp and uh, we should wield it just as it is and not dull it down. Uh, it's not a butter knife, but a sword, praise God. I want to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Jesus, as we come to you in this time of prayer, I want to thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy. Thank you that you're able to say what 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, Lord, such were some of you. Jesus, I was on the list of such were some of you that were lost, who was undone, who was in sin, that you saved and brought out of darkness and into your marvelous light. I thank you, Jesus, that you can save the drunkard, save the liar, save the fornicator, save the homosexual, save those who are lost in the depths of confusion and darkness. We know the devil today, Lord, he's the author of confusion. We know, Lord God, that in Ephesians 6, the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare, our, rather our fight is not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of outer darkness and the kingdom of wickedness in high places and therefore put on the whole armor of God. Jesus, help your children to be armored, as Ephesians says. Help us to be faithful, Jesus, as the pastor says, the, faith, the most faithful Christian at the church. Lord, to be consistent in our Bible, consistent in prayer, consistent in holy living, that we might be able to be used as an instrument of your love and truth in a dark and dying world. Lord, we love you. I thank you, Lord. I pray for that, the homosexual, the Pride Month movement, the LGBTQ, Jesus, that you would move on the orchestrators and the leaders of this thing, that Jesus, you'd save souls, Lord God, that you would oppose this movement by the Spirit, and that, Jesus, you would save souls, redeem people, and use them as your witnesses against what they once tried to destroy. 
Jesus, just as Saul of Tarshish sought to destroy Christianity, then he was not long after preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. So, Lord, I pray that you'd save people out of the homosexual movement, that they might be able to be used by you, Lord God, to, uh, to preach the faith they once sought to destroy. Lord, we love you. We pray, Lord God, let your love be known in our lives. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. Is there any announcements this morning? And we have a love offering to take up. Yes, that's our love offering. Amen. Um, where's our place at? Shannon, do you have the...